Welcome to the Poker Road Radio Show, hosted by Gavin Smith, Joe Seabock, and Bart Hansen. Poker Road Radio is the only poker radio show legally adopted by Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie. He sounds so like, I don't know, that the Weird. announcer guy is like creepy. Is that Firthy? It's creeps. I don't, it's some creepy it's style. It's a creepy creeper. guy. Anyways, welcome everybody to day on, two man. at uh, Foxwoods World Poker Finals from Mashantucket, wow. Connecticut. Uh, we got another great oh, show for you guys. First time. Ledger. You're, you're, you're one for four. Yeah, one for Mash four now. Okay. Uh, we're going to have Roy Winston, who recently won the Borgata, yeah. on the show today. And uh, he had a long place, a long run in the main event. Absolutely. Um, busted got a lot today, of TV. Though, yeah, I did bust today. And yeah. that's one day later than both of a you guys. A lot of people busted today, man. Just in the last, like, hour and a half. But he was similar to us in the fact that he played. Exactly. <laughs> oh, okay. Which <laughs> does not allow you to mock. Right. I can mock that everybody that enters $10,000 tournaments and get busted out in two hours. I mean, Well, it's what? always nice to mock people who strive for things, you know, and try to be better. Uh, Unlike you, who's just please. settled in mediocrity like a garbage puddle. 336 players started uh, today at the beginning. Day 1A and Day 1B <laughs> converged. Teddy Adalas, I don't know if you've ever heard of this guy. He's probably I think he was a local. at my table to start yesterday. Uh, he was the chip leader going in today with 184000 And remember the story that I told about yesterday? He made down the nuts. About right. Uh, right. Beth Shack laying down the uh, board of Ace, King, right. Queen, Jack, 10 with no flush possibilities. He was the other player that laid right. it down. Um, not surprisingly. He's clearly a good player. He got. Wow. That was just crazy. Unfortunately, one of our producers, <laughs> I just saw a laptop computer take about a three-foot dive. Jeez. You blow it! Perthy oh, <laughs> <laughs> just had his computer drop out of his... Uh, All right, anyways, anyways. Wow, anyways. wow. Anyways, anyways. Uh, so this guy, he was the chip leader, and not surprisingly, he's already out. He pulled but he also off. built it up, too. He had like a quarter million. When he pulled a C-Bock. <laughs> he pulled way worse than a C-Bock. I mean, th this is truly a C-Bock. <laughs> this is what the C-Bock means, is to do something like this. Uh, he is out of there, and uh, we just finished play today. There's about 130 players left. Matt Graham and Freddie D by the chip leaders. Matt Graham. I like Matt Graham. You know Matt Graham? You know Matt Graham? Matt Graham? Yeah, he's What's his guy? deal? Because I've never heard of him Matt, before. Matt G, 1983. Is I had a last longer bet with him in the Omaha tournament. Yeah. Uh, in the world During the World Series, the 5K... World uh, Omaha, and then I won. He he bust out and he left, and I was like, "Damn!" He didn't pay you? I was like, "Damn!" No, but it gets back. I, I was like, "Damn!" I, you know, I don't even know if I'll ever remember what this kid looked like again, uh -huh. but I remembered his name because he right. told me Matt Graham. So uh, he he goes he goes off into the World Series. So obviously I never run into him because there's like 70 million people there all the time. Right. So anyways, at Biloxi, I'm at Biloxi, and I bust out of the tournament. And I'm walking up. I'm talking to Cat. This kid comes up to me and says, "Hey, I owe you a thousand dollars." Oh, nice. And I'm like, sweet. <laughs> he's so actually, how honest. But, and I was right. I would not have remembered him. <laughs> he, he's actually a pretty cool kid. I like him. I've played with him a couple of times at the circuit event in San Diego, like about a year ago, was when I met him. And I heard a lot of people had beef with him online for this reason or that. I don't know all the specifics, but I always thought he was a cool kid. I like him. Now, there was one member of the Poker Road team that did yeah. semi-well here today, did just recently no. get busted, and that is Court <laughs> Harrington. How's that semi-well? Yeah, sem semi-well is definitely not the <laughs> accurate term. Well, yeah, I guess it doesn't mean anything in tournament. Semi-well is you come like 40th. Right. I wish that we still had taps. We don't have taps anymore that we can play. Uh, no, oh, I'm man. not playing taps on myself. Court, I checked, wow. I, checked the, uh, I checked the chip count updates around 6 p.m. Eastern time, which is just about two and a half hours before they broke, and you were above average. What the hell happened, buddy? Uh, started at 85. Had four great levels. You were uh, up to 140, right? I was up to 100, over 150. 100, I think yeah. I peaked at like 155. Right. Um, lost a uh, pot, got back down to 125, but was still in good shape. And uh, my table broke, and I got moved to a very tough table. And uh, combined that with uh, I just could never get anything going. I had uh, Nomly, Nanod Medic, and uh, Daryl Dickin all at the same table to my left. And every time I came in, they were either flat calling and then pushing me out on the flop, and I never hit anything, or they were just re-raising pre-flop. Right. Um, just never had a chance to get anything going and got between the blinds and then ra opening a couple times and uh, not not getting to do much. I got down to about 90K. Right. So I have a question for you. Was Nam re-raising that much? No, actually, uh, Nanad right. and Daryl were playing almost every pot right. um, against each other. And there was one other guy, too, who kept he, – he loved to come over for huge, massive overbets. Open, right. open for 6K, he'd make it. 45. It's a tough table, man. It's be, not only because you know they're good players, but those all those guys are crafty players. 
You know, well, like people I, are going to do more than just play straight ahead. You sure, I, I knew that it was going to be tough and that I had to, you know, that it wasn't going to be. The table before, I was able to really chip up all day. I never played any big pots at all. I um, was able to just pick up small pot, small pot, small pot, and everybody seemed to be afraid to bust out, which was great. Um, we, yeah. You know, we talked a little bit about this at Falls View, Gavin, Barry, and I, and, um, you know, I came under the misconception that you go around this tournament and, you know, half the players are touring pros, but it's really not the case. It's like right. 10 or 20 percent, right? So how important is the table draw? Is it just, a, I mean, that's got to be, I mean, there's luck in the cards. Table what about luck in the table draw? Well, if I had stayed at the same table I was at, yeah. I would have finished the day with 150K instead of zero. The big thing about table draw is obviously you don't want to have a ton of, you know, good right, player, good right. players at your table because just because you're a, a known touring pro doesn't necessarily mean you're a good player. Right. Mm -hmm. So you don't mind having some of them at your table, but you don't want to have a good player at your table. But more important than that, you don't want to draw what court drew and have three good players right. all have position on you. Yeah, right. to your left. I right. mean, and I think probably the biggest mistake probably court made. Uh, I'm I'm surmising here because I haven't even talked to him, but I think the, probably the biggest mistake he made was thinking that he could go in there and play basically the same style that he'd been playing for the previous four levels at his other table, mm -hmm. rather than adjusting quick enough and probably tightening way up on preflop raising. Because if, if they're coming over the top of you and if they're flat calling you so often, well, then, you know, you're just going to have to sort of give up on, you know, popping right. it up with the jack nine of hearts and with the queen ten or whatever, you know, or with a seven. Sure, sure. Whatever. A lot of the hands like that I obviously raise each and every time, you know, five deuce of clubs and right. all those. Well, cute, I think it's a good things. question. What do you think, Court? Do you think that you. Uh, actually, I had that thought coming in yeah. and I managed to pick up ace queen four times. So and you just uh, had hands you had to you had to kind of open with. Yeah, and it and just never hit, never whiffed anything. No draws, no pairs, nothing. Right. Did you ever consider just limping with the ace queen? Uh, no, I didn't. I don't generally limp a lot of hands. Uh, I, I did limp. Actually, I limped a few pairs. I limped, uh, like, pocket sixes I limped and uh, with the flop. Um, pocket fours I limped and with the flop. And remember, I was only at this table for an hour and 20 minutes, so I got right. a lot of playable hands. Right. Um, and I, I, the mistake I made, I guess, in the last hand was actually opening with queen ten of diamonds and then uh, knowing that Daryl was going to come with me because he was in the big blonde. Right. Well, I mean, I don't know. It depends on where you are. I don't think playing queen ten of diamonds is necessarily a huge mistake. I mean... Or we could all be quiet. That's cool. All right. Well. We'll yeah, they're motioning at me to do that. Yeah, I, I can't stand it when, when people do that. When, when you're trying to talk like we're a radio show here, well, it's and a, you're getting this fucking it's, shit. It's a funky <laughs> thing. I'm telling you, every time that happens, <laughs> it throws me off. But it's a tricky thing because we were going to go right from court into the chainsaw thing. So I was trying to tell him like uh, we're going to go. And chainsaw. that means chainsaw. <laughs> yeah. This 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 this, this generally means like, I'm ringing that out a means towel. Chainsaw. Uh, yeah, chain, oh, or maybe this maybe maybe I don't this know, maybe. Fuck. This is unbelievable. <laughs> but the whole fucking hand thing, that's, I, I've always had problems with that. That's always true. Uh, Gavin, chainsaw. Uh, yeah. <laughs> All right, Bart, give me that motion chainsaw. again, and we'll fire <laughs> the sucker off. Good. Oh. oh. The Alan Kessler update. Oh, God. <laughs> well, there was another gentleman that came in uh, short stacked. Chainsaw. And, and guys, At chainsaw. Alan Kessler actually came in with 9,900. Right. Doubled through three times and you know then lost well. a big race you know and he, was out. You know what he said to me? I almost punched him in his lip. <laughs> I was upstairs getting a sandwich. <laughs> and What kind of sandwich? Uh, a turkey sandwich. Hot turkey from the Carnegie Deli. Delicious. Oh, it's delicious. So, delicious. so, yeah. so you know, Chainsaw walks out. And I'm like, I'm like, what's up, Chainsaw? And he's wearing a Poker Road patch, which what? I was obviously happy about. He walks by and he goes, he goes, unlucky patch. Unlucky patch right here. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I was like. <laughs> unlucky for us. <laughs> yeah, I was like, yeah, unlucky for us that you're wearing it and you can't play poker for shite. <laughs> um, Kessler also uh, mentioned the fact that he did not like t the two R's in PokerRoad.com as well. I've heard this. Similar to PokerRoom.com. Right. He I've heard this. It gave him bad memories. And if I had the capability to <laughs> alter language, <laughs> then it gave I him could do bad memories. Right. Yeah, it gave him bad memories. Chainsaw. Chainsaw had memories of like right. having to cut that wood without proper oiling on the <laughs> chain. It was the bad. The only thing. The, the only thing I could have done is if, if we decided to call it Poka Road, like P O K A H R O D. Yeah, I mean, what but are going to do? Since we live in the world of um, English speaking people with intelligence, I, I didn't have that option. I thought it was Poker also stars. fairly amusing. I was down here with uh, Al uh, prepping the show, and Alan came over and went on a half an hour spiel about what do you think about this tournament idea? If you move all in and you have a pair versus over cards or you have an over pair versus a smaller pair, you have the option to take 50% of the pot or 75% <laughs> of the pot. And I was like, oh, 
That sounds interesting, Alan. And then he would go back in and he'd be like, really, what do you think about that idea? I think it would be great. I've the actually, guy's out of his mind. Well, I've actually He's had this conversation absolutely before. absolutely crazy. I think, <laughs> I think it would be cool if you, when you played a tournament, you, when you ever you got all the money in, you immediately figured out the odds and half the pot you played for straight up, but the other half you would determine like if you I actually had the idea. best idea. I actually don't fun. mind his idea. It's just I don't think I think it takes the luckness factor out of poker. It does. Like said, how much how it many people does. are pros? You no, know, of you course, can't just of course. do that all You can never time. do it. It's just fun to talk about. That's I hate that idea. One thing I think is a good idea though, is with his whole two R thing, yeah. you should buy the name P O K E R O A D. Dot com and okay. have them both go to the same place. So if someone doesn't type in both R's, oh, that, that's a good they point. still go back. That's a, we could redirect. That's a very good point. This is what Gavin does. He'll be like, I'm drinking cocktails. I'm you know falling over myself. Then genius. He pulls a stick of genius out of his mind. <laughs> How did and you he end gives up with the name anyways? Poker Road? Yeah, because um, we're on the road and we play poker. It, yeah, I mean, it was part of that, you know, because in the beginning, it all was going to be born from the radio show, mm -hmm. which was a road radio show. Obviously, Poker Road, there's a certain ring to that. Obviously, you know, living on Poker Road, the, all these concepts kind of popped up. Um, so we went with that. Poker Street, we talked about for a while. So I like Poker Road much better than Poker Street. I think Poker Road is better as well. So who knows? Who knows? You know, there's a lot of, uh, there's more and more information coming out about uh, Absolute. That guy, Nat, went down to Costa Rica. We're going to cover that over the next few days because it's just oh, a little yeah? bit nauseating. I but haven't read anything about There was an interesting article that uh, came out a couple of days ago. Bringing you the biggest stories. Or, well, whatever we could find 10 minutes before the show. Poker News! <laughs> Very Poker interesting. Uh, 2005 Seniors Champion, Seniors World Series of Poker Champion, William Paul Cigar McKinney was arrested with Cigar. 15 others during a gambling raid in Kingsport, Tennessee. Yeah, this you got to watch out on those 80-year-old 80 82-year-old you know guy. Yeah, <laughs> Police seized $19,900 in cash, several decks of uh, of playing cards. Several decks of cards. Very dangerous decks of playing cards. McKinney also... They have very, very sharp edges, those cards. You could kill several... A juggler game nothing really could easily be sliced with it. Here, here's the kicker. McKinney, 82, Ran. had an undisclosed <laughs> number of pills. <laughs> he had pills. Undisclosed pills. number no. of pills on an his person. An 82-year-old man had pills. At God the time forbid. of the raid, and he also faces one charge of possession of Schedule 3 narcotics. Yeah, nitroglycerin. Nitroglycerin. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you know what probably happened is this guy was playing cards with his buddies, sipping lemonade in some room in Tennessee, and he, and he had exactly what Gavin said, nitro pills for his heart. <laughs> is probably what happened. But because... Card players are such hardened, evil criminals. We have to take them all down. We chased this 88-year-old man and drug his tired, broken ass. I think they chased him all the way to Mexico, and his only hope now is that Joe will smuggle him back. You know, if, he, we were, if he calls me up, I'll take care of him. We were talking about marijuana yesterday. This is the thing that always bothers me, and I think in, in cops' defenses, they're like, well, it's not I our choice. Was, I we, thought mostly it was the mirror that always bothered you. Oh, he's so quick. Oh. So he always goes so for the low, quick. you know, I know the low blow. He's so <laughs> quick. <laughs> Cops will say, well, it's not my job to uh, write the law. I'm just going to enforce no, the law. We were talking right. about marijuana, too, right. and it was like, well, I mean, can't right. these guys have a little bit of discretion, personal well, discretion? Well, well the, here's the – you mean the cops? Yeah, the cops. No, I mean, they, they, they can't, me? though. They, I understand. Well, I, I understand. Then they have more discretion for their they, friends. They can't do it. Yeah, the problem is once you open up or that door – Or for the guy that gives them a few hundred. Right. Once you open up that door, then all of a sudden there's all these possibilities, exactly what Gavin said. That then, it, then it becomes that the law is open to individual interpretation for each person enforcing it. So in theory, I agree with you, Bart, and I think uh, you know you wish that these things could be, but I understand why they can't be. If customs officials of had discretion, things. then Joe Seabock exactly. would have been in Canada. Then I would have more probably <laughs> He would have been a $1,000 lighter, but he would have been there. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It just seems like this is happening more and more. It's normally like in southern states, like in yeah. the Carolinas, Gratz got in trouble. It's stupid. It happens all over in Florida. I just wonder if the online thing might change things when that becomes I, legal. Obviously, we are all say, desperately hope so. Uh, who hope knows? So. Who knows? Well, that's going to bring us to our first break. We've got a whole lot more coming up, including uh, Roy Winston. So stick around. We'll be back here on Poker Road Radio. And we are coming back here with Poker Road Radio from lovely Mashantucket Ledger, as Gavin likes wow. to say. Two times now. Connecticut. Um, You're rolling now. You know, coming back here, now it was interesting, Bobby Bolande, we've talked about him on the show before, he was just kicked off oh, You're of an Survivor. asshole. What? <laughs> Why? I TiVo that. Oh, oh How was wow. I supposed to know? That Thanks, buddy. Thanks, That's buddy. whole segment about it. I thought That's you might have gone to the party that he had it's last true. night. You probably were going to find out. You blew it. You probably were going to find out some other way, I would think. What a jerk. I was actually very, very impressed with the fact that he said Where so did he have a party last night? 
Uh, at one of the bars here or something like that. Really? Yeah, he had a viewing party, but he stayed uh -huh. tight lip about it the entire time. Never really have, he had to. He would have been like annihilated. Yes, but he didn't get any money from it anyway. It though, right? Dude, they'll s they'll come after you. You have to sign these uh, non disclosure agreements when now, you do uh, these shows. Did you see any? So you have you been watching the whole season? Yeah, but I've missed the last three weeks, and now you're fucking <laughs> just ruining one week of them for me. <laughs> and how has he been coming off on? on oh, the he's show a dick. Anything? He's is a he dick. Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. You know he's what? Like, <laughs> his, bi his biggest line was when the girl could actually hear him. They're saying that, like the girl's literally twenty yards away from him. Right. And he's like, "We got to vote Courtney off," <laughs> right? And then, but then he's talking to this guy James, and his line is, "The only thing better than winning a million dollars is winning a million dollars and getting some ass." <laughs> oh God, <laughs> I don't remember who it was. It may have been Alifex who told me earlier that that his biggest thing was he's always like, "I am a poker player, okay? I can read what all these people well, are trying to do Joe, to me." It, on that topic, we <laughs> actually have a soundbite of him uh, okay. relating the show oh, good, to good, tournament good. poker. So let's so take a listen. If I were to relate what happened now to a game of poker, it oh, would be God. like a tournament poker game where you're getting down to the final table and the chips are pretty even. And, you know, sometimes you can play conservative and just wait and wait and wait for aces, wait for kings, and just blind off your chips. Um, and the proper move might have been for me to just vote PG out today Go with it, vote Eric out the next one, vote Frosty out the next one, and then make it down to the top six, five, or four. But I'm playing for first. I'm playing for first, and the only person who really threatened that first place position for me was James. And if I got a chance to knock him out, I want to knock him out now. I'm moving all in. Oh, I God. pushed all in, and you know what? Didn't work out for me. Had I succeeded in today's move, there's a good chance I would have won the tournament. I would have won this. Oh, uh, he's confused. Just like I would have won a tournament. Now, what's your, now, you've been watching the episode. What's your view on his analysis? Well, I mean, I don't know. I, mean, I think, <laughs> I think so that I don't really him. think that you can <laughs> think that Bobby Belonde <laughs> making tournament references is all that smart to begin with. <laughs> I don't think he's actually ever won a tournament. I mean, you know, yeah, if, if he's he playing either. for first, maybe he should figure out what you have to do to get first. Now, a lot of people, <laughs> a lot of people don't know, and I, I had heard this. I'm, I'm not sure it was true, but I think it is true that Negrano was the one that was offered this first, and he I turned it down. Well. I heard this, as and well. then the Blonde took it. I heard. Well, I heard that. Uh, I'm not so sure Daniel's necessarily offered. I think that they suggested to Daniel the possibility that they might enjoy having him on the show and that he should go through the interview process. And Daniel, I think, immediately said, well, I'm going to be at the World Series and there's right. no way I'm going to do that. That's what I, I think happened. I heard that he had the poker player physique, though, too, without a shirt on. Oh, did he? Oh, sloppy. Bobby, Bobby, <laughs> you had a freaking belly on him. Like yeah. You can imagine, man. <laughs> I know. Uh, there, he's a, fa he's a <laughs> fat muffle. The funniest thing, too, is that Bobby had lipo earlier this year. I was going to say, I was like, what the hell? <laughs> what, they what the hell did they take out? <laughs> or, was was the, or, or do they have reverse lipo where they throw some fat in there? <laughs> <laughs> I, do, I, I do. wonder if Roy Winston was the one who did the uh, lipo on Bobby Blonde. Then I can see why he went out of business. I mean, circle of life. I do have to say, though, that he was going to New York last night because I was playing in the poker room, and he came. And he said, Bart, um, do you have 500 bucks? I'll transfer it to you on my uh, full tilt account. This is account. Bobby. Bobby, this is Bobby. Yeah. And I was like, uh, no, Bobby, I, I don't do that. I don't play online, which was, which was a lie. At this stage, I believe that I was targeted <laughs> or voted out, not because of me oh, being God. anxious or being a jerk or getting on people's nerves. Um, that may have been the case for one or two votes. But I think oh, he's not they got rid of me because they've come to realize that I was indeed the biggest threat. I'm the best. <laughs> I'm the best. Is that is that how he plays his poker too with the well, ace nine? Well, he certainly thinks he's the best. Barry nice lay down. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, if I hear him say nice lay down one more time, I mean honestly, we gotta have Bobby Belanda on the show. He will be hilarious. We should oh, have him absolutely. on the show. Have Let's have him at Bellagio because I think he's already gone from here, right? Yeah. Yeah. He left last night. We'll have him on Bellagio. Yeah. All right, no, Bellagio. Bellagio. We're Folks, we're going to bring you Bobby Blonde. Yeah, and he we'll will tell us what's up with the lipo, what's up with the survivor, yeah. what's up with the weird, uncomfortable turn tournament analogies that he's making. But all of it. You know, the interesting thing too is, is like it seems we might like have to have a double issue. A double Bobby, Bobby Blonde show. Have to be a two, it might have to be a, a, a two, a part <laughs> one and two. Seven. It, it seems like a guy like that feeds off that all that ego stuff, and right. now that he's going to be recognized outside of poker by like you well, know people in the Midwest. Told, Bobby's not a bad guy. Like he's a funny guy. No, I don't. He's just him. very, you know, he thinks he's the best. He greatly exaggerates. He is the best hustler in the world. He's he's an amazing hustler. We've, he never we've covered has that. any money. It's amazing. He How does he lose ninety thousand dollars when exactly. he doesn't have any money? He he's is an amazing, an amazing hustler. He can just get into these situations. He talks people into it. It's unbelievable. It really is. So anytime he wants to borrow money, you're never going to see it back. No, I'm, I'm not, not going to say true. that. No. I've never. You know, I've no, loaned I've money. loaned him money. I've he loaned him money. Got it back. Yeah, he paid me back. He will pay you back if he has it. Yeah, but it's just an issue of does he have it or not. And I can honestly say I loaned him money, and you know, it took a little while, but every time he saw me, he was like, hey. 
I got, you know, um, don't worry after that. I, I, I remember the situation. Well, First is the jerk-offs when you loan them money, and they forget. Really and they're like, they literally don't even remember. Bobby actually has, he, he's often said that he wants to write a book, and I think it will be one of the best books. That would be books, a great book. But he wants to him. title yeah. his book, yeah. right. Being Broke and Living Like a Millionaire. Right. Right. And he does it. And I think it would probably be one of the most successful books ever. I, I agree. And I'll I read agree. it. I will read, I will read it Bobby. Too. I will read your book. This is what he thought about his experience on Survivor. Wow. I really feel like I've just blown a month of my life for nothing. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, I, I, it's incredible. Entertaining, though. The He's funniest thing was going into Survivor. Bobby's going in, and there's a bunch of people that would really would like to buy pieces of him, right? Just to have the sweat of right, watching right, the show right. and watching right. it would be fun. And Bobby's like, seriously, seriously, I think that I'm at least a two to one favorite <laughs> over the field. Over the field, just the whole I field. Have, I have to be at least a two to one favorite. <laughs> and I'm like, why, Bobby? Nobody else watches the show. <laughs> Nobody else trains for it and gets prepared for it. I mean, how can you just say you're going to be a two to one favorite? And then when he got there, it was clear that he, he was, was like a two to one dog. Oh, actually. way more than that. Way more than that. There was, a, there was at least six people yeah. that I would have picked way before Bobby to win <laughs> right. to, to win it. <laughs> We're going to move on here to, uh, of course, hand of the day. And this was an interesting hand that came up uh, between uh, Justin, Z Justin Bonomo and uh, Isabel Mercier and a couple other players. And I'll start it off. Uh, <laughs> Z Justin Bonomo raises from the hijack, which is one off the cutoff from people that don't know. Cutoff calls. Isabel I didn't know. Mercier and Eric Sheets Haber both call from the blinds as well. The flop comes 7 7 6 with two diamonds. Four players in there. Everybody checks. The turn is a jack of diamonds, bringing three diamonds out there. Mercier bets 4,600. Haber thinks for a while and then makes the call, as does Bonomo. The cutoff now moves in for an additional 9,200. And after some thought, Mercier, Mercier finally lay down what she claims is a seven. Haber moves all in and Bonomo folds ace jack face up. The cutoff shows 10, nine of diamonds for a diamond draw and a gut shot. And Haber shows ace deuce of diamonds for the well, nut no, he made, no, no, he made he's his got, diamond He's got draw. a flush draw, he but he's got a gut shot straight flush draw. Right, 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 right. He made his, uh, he made his excuse draw. Excuse me, fl flush, flush over flush. Right, right. right. It right. sounds pretty what straightforward. I, what, it's yeah. very straightforward. Yeah. The only thing that, I, that, that confuses me about the whole hand is, wow, Z Justin. What a huge laydown. He's trying to is it, is it How do you make the first $4,600 <laughs> call? With four people. Right? The There's three diamonds and, this and a paired board, and, and now he's got top pair. Wow. And then, but he was able to lay it down. That is why the bear is getting screwed over in that. In this, yeah, right, right, right. He's now, a big dog. I just thought it was interesting. Mercier, I mean, with the trip sevens, is that a pretty standard laydown as well? well? It's different than many, Jack. You got to you I don't think. Hold on. I don't think it's standard. You got to make the lay down with that many people. The biggest, on pot. Pro the biggest I mean. problem she's got, right? She's got a seven. Right. She's bet it. She's now got two callers. Right. And now a guy goes all in. So it can't be. I good. mean, there's got to at least, at the very least, there has to be a flush there. And then you have to worry about you're drawing completely dead. Like if someone's got right. two jacks or, or is already full up. And who, who knows what her kicker was? She might have had a the, terrible the kicker. The thing too. I don't understand about this, and Barry went over it actually at Niagara pretty well. Actually, he went over it in our private radio. Right. phone call that he had with me after oh, the yeah. first show and he was like I didn't like the hand of the day so right, right, right. we were speaking on the phone is I got in the cutoff raises and there's four people in there okay and the board comes out 776 and let's say I have a 7 right. well everybody flat called the cutoff guy the chances are the cutoff guy there's a real good chance he might not have much right. doesn't necessarily have an overpair or a 7 sure. so why am I going to assume that someone's going to fire out there on, on a draw heavy board why not just fire first obviously she's looking for the check raise but in that right. situation with 4 players there's a real good chance it might get checked around mm, right I don't know I'm, uh, not so, I'm not so sure that that's a pretty good board to get a bet yeah, 7, 7, I mean, 6 right. 2 diamonds there's a lot of draws there anybody that has a pair right. uh, anybody that's got a good ace might bet that board I mean, there, there's a really good. But there's chance. all. I mean, isn't that times two when Ace Deuce Diamonds takes a card? Nine ten of Diamonds takes a card. That's yeah, but I, sure, I'm not sure. so sure that's going to happen uh, all that frequently. I think more often than not, you're going to get a bet out of, especially the nine ten. I think the nine ten of Diamonds was on the button. Yeah. Is that is that correct? Uh, I'm not positive, but. Uh, I, Cutoff was nine ten of diamonds. Actually, he was the pre-flop raiser, so he did not make the continuation. Right, yeah, pretty so good right. flop for nine ten of diamonds. Right, it's it's pretty rare. Yeah. That guy's it's pretty rare that he there. checked that. But hand. It's it's a good, it's a decent board to check a seven. I think I don't think it's a terrible the worst play in the world. No. It's your first act. And the other interesting thing, too, is Mercier. I mean, her name came up, and I, I looked back over the WPT records, and, yeah, she finished first in uh, the ladies' event. But if you guys play with her, she hasn't really done all that much, has she? She's had a lot of mercy. <laughs> she, yeah. I'm I not mean, is she, she in some of the same class with kind of she's in there because she's a woman and not that good of a player? No comment. Oh, come on, Joey. This <laughs> is an uncensored show. What the hell? Yeah. <laughs> Isabel, I think that Isabel, Isabel Mercier is a decent woman player. Yeah, a decent woman player. Right. And uh, so if you're asking me, is she in the top of the elite 
tournament players of the world, then I would say no. Um, is she potentially a winner at tournaments? Maybe she could be a marginal winner. Um, and does she play, you know, is she, is she one of the top women? Probably she is one of the top women. But the, it, it, it's pretty clear that, you know, the top women player probably women players out there probably aren't in the top right. 40 or 50 players in the world. I would agree. Yeah. I would agree with that. Now, we had an interesting email here from uh, David Palm, and this question came in for Gavin. He said Ke Gavin had just made a comment about – Why am I even on this show? Thank God Barry's not here. <laughs> What's Last the point? Week, I didn't Why do I waste my goddamn time coming here? Seabock, we have a question for you here too. Gavin oh. just made a comment about rarely re-raising so he can disguise his strong and well-speculative hands. Know. He plays bad. We've covered What that. situation would he re-raise? Uh, I would re-raise when I'm beginning to get short and I'm going to be making an all-in stance. Um, I would re-raise if there's a lot of players in there and I maybe have kings or queens in the blind and – uh, Colin is going to put me in a really uncomfortable spot of being out of position in like a seven-way pot. Um, yeah, that's about it. Yeah, I mean, what about you when re-raising? Just runs uh, the gamut when I have a hand. So or usually re-raise, or when you don't. Yeah, I'm I I re-raise a lot. You know, if I ever smell weakness, I re-raise. If you know, and I obviously play. You know, I play my big hands and my weak hands the same way. You know, we've covered that before. You know, so I'm always in there firing, especially if I feel somebody's weak, especially if I have more chips. You know, because I think that, that that whole dichotomy of of having a lot of chips versus the people you have covered, you have to, you know, you have to put that on people. You have to make sure that they know that. You know, and I definitely lean on people in those spots. I think so that if you were, it's very I think that if you were to draw out comparisons, you know, and this is obviously very very loose and very broad, um, I probably play a lot more like a Daniel Negreanu type player, and Joe plays a lot more like a John Juana type player. You know, and both both these people have had tremendous success at their styles of play. Just one chooses to do more of a post-flop game and one do chooses right. to do more of a pre-flop game. Right. And, you know, there's there's pros and cons to both. Well, Adam Perkins has question for Joe. Yeah. Hi, guys. This question is for Joe. Seventh Bach Greenstein. Yeah, do you <laughs> still, seventh Bach. Do you still play I'm in a lot of... I'm not accepting this fucking question if this guy's <laughs> going to call me seventh Bach. <laughs> do you still play in a lot of prelim events or do you just play the $10,000 main events? Just wondering because most of your winnings have come from these events. I guess this guy's a master of the it obvious. Is. Thanks to uh, hear your obvious. great show. Guys, um, what's the deal with these prelim events? You've had a lot of success. I have had a lot of success. Um, I've been able to play in as many of them recently just because of Poker Road and getting everything off the ground. So it's been tough um, from that respect. But I love playing those events. They're fun. You know, you get in there, you hang out with people a little bit more. Um, 5,000 and 3,000, stuff like that. Yeah, right? I don't know why. Everyone asked me this question, why have I had more success in them? And, you know, the, the, the most obvious thing that you would say is pressure. But I don't think that the, the, the pressure affects me at all in terms of playing in a 10,000. How about the most time. obvious thing being most of the good players aren't playing them? That's not true, though. That's not true at all. I think there's just as many Yahoos playing in these 10K events. No, I, I understand. But the Yahoos that are playing these are all playing the 5Ks. But, you, but you've got probably, you know, 20 or 30 or 40 of the top pros in the world that don't bother going yeah. to play the, the the 5Ks. I'm not saying that's the reason, but right, I mean, right, if right. it's 15% of a touring pros play in the $10,000 event, it's right. probably got to be in the right. single digits for those. Oh, for sure. Events, I would right. I would say right. I would say less than half of the people that play the 10Ks right. come early enough to play the 5Ks or the, the 3Ks. Fact, I think the fact of the matter is I've had similar success in main events as I had as I have in these. The difference is I've got a lot of like 10th through 20th in the main events where, when I and I've actually been making the final tables in the prelims. So it's really just a hand here and there difference. I don't think that there's that much of a difference. It's obviously, you know, things have gone my way in the prelims whereas they haven't towards the end of these tournaments. So you know, I heard in some of the prelims too they don't have a seventh position. They yeah, they skip, they take it out. <laughs> and that's why there's <laughs> nowhere else for me to, to go. <laughs> Those are eighth to six, <laughs> and, that, and that has really helped out. Joe. Once I get past eighth, I know there's no seventh, so I go straight to first. That's that's yeah. the difference, you know. Another question here from uh, Robert Yoakum, and he's one of the Life's of Bluff guys, of course, doing the comic on Poker Road. Absolutely. Poker Road. Absolutely. Poker, what's the name of that comic? Living on Poker Road, Living actually on. debuting this Sunday. Okay. Um, it's very very cool. Um, I. I <laughs> Thank you. I co-wrote um, all the characters up with um, Frank Fursina, who owns yeah. Life of Bluff. Yeah. And it's it's fun stuff. They're going to be doing some comics with you and I. Some of the characters have been getting into prop bets and shit like that. So it's going to be fun. And Robert talks about an email to sum it up, basically. We talk about moving up in, in cash games, but when do you start to move up when you're a successful tournament player? I've been playing low-level sit-and-goes and, and multi-table tournaments now and then. Um, but when do I make my occasional shot to move up, right. and how much is a shot? Like ten times the buy-in, right. ten well, times my normal buy-in. I don't. Th go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. No, I, after you. I, I mean, especially if he's playing them online, he should be able to get stats. You know, he should be able to get stats. And if I mean, if he's, uh, if he's, when he started out, if he was cashing, say twenty percent of the time, 
And now all of a sudden he's cashing 50% of the time in his sit and goes, well, then that's probably a time to, to start thinking about right. moving up. And, you know, if you want to take shots, you know, if your normal normal sit and go is a $20 sit and go and say you have $500 in your bankroll, I don't think taking two shots at $50 sit and goes out of a $500 bankroll is, you know, a bad thing to do. Cause it's still going to still gonna move you back to a comfortable bankroll and you've got a couple of shots. So you could look and see when the lineup's good and go. I think probably what he feels in the email is, is that unless you were to win a small tournament, you don't win enough money even by placing high to say well, move up. Well, it kind of you know? depends, you know, because I'm a huge proponent of, of just taking shots. And I think on the show we always have been. Mm -hmm. We always say, screw it, man. You're doing well. Take a shot, man. You don't know how it's going to go. Um, and that's how I got started at the World Series. I, mean, I didn't know what the hell I was doing. And I just took a couple shots, you know, and came away with $100,000. Um, so, you know, I have no rules about it, you know, and I don't th I think it's maybe a bad thing to have these specific rules. But when you're comfortable and, you know, you feel like you've been doing all right and you've made a little bit of money and you can withstand that hit, that 5,000 or 2,000 or 3,000 hit for that event, then take a shot, you know, because you never know. You never I'd know have a rule. I think, I think if, I, was, rule? if I, I, I don't have a rule because I'm an idiot, but right. if I was going to be smart. <laughs> if you were intelligent, if I was going to be smart, if I was going to be smart, but I, I, I would have a rule. And I would say that, you know, if normally you're trying to, say, keep uh, 20 buy ins in your bankroll. Um, you know, which I think would be probably pretty reasonable uh, for if you're doing $20 right. sit and goes. I think a $400 bankroll would be reasonable. Then I, I think that you could probably afford to risk 10% of your bankroll on a shot. And then, you know, you know, maybe, and then if that works out, then fine. Or, you know, maybe up to 20 at the maximum, but no more than 20% of right. your bankroll. So I have think. a question for you. Why can, why can you not be this logical in your own life? Because uh, I'm an idiot. Yeah. Okay, I just wanted to get that answer. Go ahead. <laughs> Moving along here, we got an email here from Chad Thompson. Again, you can email us at PR. Chad Thompson? Thompson. Oh. Thom Thompson. I, like, I like the other name better, too, though. <laughs> PR Radio at PokerRoad.com. Again, PR Radio at PokerRoad.com. Is that PR ra Radio at PokerRoad.com? PR Radio at PokerRoad.com. It is, PR Radio. Uh, hey guys, yeah. I was listening to the Cash Game Corner from the Josh Arie show, and the pocket king's hand that Bar Bart badly played reminded me of a hand <laughs> that I played in my 510 No Limit game in Vancouver. I have a tight, aggressive image, and I'm known to limp under the gun with my big hands. I'll, I limp under the gun, and an aggressive player to my left uh, makes it 50 to go. Two people call, and I repop to 300. So limp re-raise to 300. The flop comes down ace, four, seven with two, dime, uh, with two spades. Ace of clubs, four, seven. Four of spades, seven of spades. And being scared that he called with an ace, I check the flop, and he bets 600. I only had 1,100 in front of me. I tank for three minutes to try to figure out if there was any way he could actually have an ace and figured with ace, queen, or ace, king, he would not have an ace, and there'd nothing to be scared of. He wouldn't bet so much. So I check-raised him all in, and he called with a hand as weak as queen-queen. Here's the thing. I didn't have pocket kings in that hand. I had jack-8 of spades for a flush draw. This is a concept that we went over yesterday and in real life here. When you have a draw, just like I misplayed it yesterday, right. there is no sense in check-raising a guy and getting him to commit right. money so well, that he calls with queen-queen. Queen. It's when you don't want action. For well, whatever reason. Well, you don't want to lay odds there. Right, exactly. so you actually want to win the pot. Exactly. Right. I, I've actually discussed uh, this particular thing in my chapter in the in the Full Tilt book that I wrote on Planet Big Strack. Oh, look at this guy. And uh, it, it, I think a lot of times what you want to do uh, in a situation like that is you want to bet out because the problem is, is that what the check raise does is it creates an emotional feeling on people. People don't like to get check raised. Right, and a lot of times people will make a lot bigger laydowns if you just bet out. And you're ah oh, man, great laydown. You know, I had the ace. You know, right. and because now they're not emotionally bound to it, they think you're being a nice guy because you're 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 showing them what you have right. rather than being a dick and check raising. Trying to get the match. So people are like emotional players get a little tied, to, a little more tied to hands when you check raise because they think it's sort of a shot against them. Right. And so a lot of times if you're trying to pick up a pot when you're sort of marginal there and you have a draw, just leading out is uh, is the play because you can always just tell them you have an ace anyway. And I hate getting check raised. It pisses people off. Sometimes, man, if I if, if some guy there's check actual home games out there that don't allow check raises. Yeah, I know. Yeah, 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 yeah. It pisses people off uh, so uh, much. Sometimes I just move <laughs> in. I just get so irritated with somebody's done it to me like two or three times. Fuck it, I'm just all in. And again, if you want to leave uh, voicemails, you can uh, call us at eight seven seven eight three six road. 877-836-7623. Row ad. So we will be back here from Foxwoods with Roy Winston. Stick around here on Poker Road Radio. And we are back here on Poker Road Radio from Foxwoods in Connecticut with today's guest, Roy Winston. How are you doing today, Roy? I'm doing great, Bart. Uh, Roy, you know, you've really been on quite a tear, but before I get to your recent accomplishments, of course, we saw you. Does Roy uh, know the name of the tribe? 
that runs Foxwoods Casino. Do you? Do you know where we are right now? Mashantucket. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Well, well done. Well done. You've already done a better job than <laughs> our current host. At 2 a.m., I'm sitting there watching TV, and boom, they keep saying the Mashantucket Tribe right, Museum. Right, right. Uh, extensive coverage in the main event, but um, tell us a little bit about how this event went for you. You got knocked out at what about in the middle of day two today? Same kind of thing that happened to you at Falls View, right? You made it on to day two. Right. You know, I had good chips in Falls View in here at the end of day one, and. Um, Difference though, I think in Fallsview, I, I actually played badly. I think I made I'm, I just made a stupid mistake, and uh, I got my money in against Lee Markle badly, and um, that's never a good thing against Lee. Um, well, here though, definitely getting I don't think it's anyone. Yeah, getting his money, <laughs> your money in against Lee Markle generally means you've probably got it in kind of bad because yeah. he's kind of a tight. He ass. is kind of a tight guy. Is you he know, never making any moves or anything like no, that? He makes some moves. Oh, yeah. He does, he but makes, he's he makes small pot moves. Right. You know? As soon as he said, "I call," if I there's do a lot of money in the pot. He doesn't usually have a. He's not making a move. You know, anymore. I had bottom pair, no kicker, and he had a set, so it was close. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, that's all. And what happened uh, in this tournament? Yeah, this tournament, I had a guy uh, who had a lot of chips and was playing every pot. And um, I wake up with ace king, flop two kings, and he has <laughs> king nine, nine on the river. I don't have to oh. say anymore. Oh, wow. you got it all in there on the flop? Yeah. Well, well, obviously, not much you can do with yeah, that. Yeah, that stinks. Now, you just. How big was the pot? About 180,000. Ah. Oh, God. Yeah. That's sick. Now, you just won uh, Borgata. Uh, a few months back. Oh, so we don't have to worry about this then. We're not Kimmy upset. <laughs> well, I mean, well, he was uh. all excited at Falls View. You wanted to be the the first I wanted player to be ever. Back to back. To do back. No one has ever done back to back, right? I believe so. No one. And I still haven't done back it. Back. I'm still, still haven't done it. was grinder, yeah. But I mean, what is, I mean, did you learn anything towards the end of that tournament that's going to help you in some of these tournaments too? You know, you made it to the final table six-handed. Um, well, I think I think in Falls View, I was I was a little impatient. I really wanted to make things happen. And in poker, you can't do that. You got to let it. You got to right. take what it gives you. And I think if you try to push the action too much, you know, you're going to make a mistake, which is what I did. So what uh, you're telling us is you had a C-Bach. I had a C-Bach. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know that. I don't push the action all the time. Nuclear tilt, I think. I haven't. Well, see, I don't tilt very often, but I do push the action way too much, way too often. So. I don't know. Now, at the main event, you finished, what, in the 20s, right? I finished 26th. And, 26. Um, I, I felt like there I played very well. I got all my money in good at the end against uh, Jerry Yang, who uh, got a little lucky on me. And uh, actually, I had all his chips in the middle, too. So if I win that hand, maybe I'm Jerry Yang. Was that the uh, one that you had pocket nines and he had ace rag or something like that? And he no, had I had pocket queens. He had ace king. Oh, okay. So it was a, a race. It yeah, it was a, it was a that bad. Race. Now, one of the biggest hands that we saw that was featured uh, on ESPN was, I don't know if you guys saw it, the four flush. Mm -hmm. And uh, Kenny Tran check calling him all the way with an eight high board. Kenny Tran had ace eight off. He had an ace ten with no club. Neither player had a club. Right. And a uh, big check call on the flop on the turn and on the river. Now, you play with Kenny in some of the cash games, right? Uh, right. which I'm going to ask you a little bit later on. But that was pretty sick. Right. You know what? It's funny. Line. Yeah, because I, I play with Kenny extensively in cash games. And I think Kenny is one of the most skilled cash players in the world. I think there's very few people in his league, and I don't bluff into him generally, and he doesn't ever pick me off in a bluff because I just, when I try to play Kenny, you know, right. I try to have it. And that's why I thought it was a good opportunity to make that move on him there, and he somehow called me down. It was a great call. I just, I just don't know so, how he did so it. Well, I was watching, though, last night. I was, I was watching the, the horse event last night, right. and they came up there on the horse event saying that Kenny Tran's nickname was Sick Call Tran. And then I watched it, and I think, that he's kind of a lot like Gavin Smith and the fact that it's not necessarily sick called Tran, it's always called Tran. <laughs> I mean, well, it's but he got knocked out when a guy moved in on him with when he made the nut flush at the end, right? right. And he was right. like, oh, I got to go with my read. Uh, there was that extensive period of time when ESPN kept sh showing him calling people's got hands out. And he's right. like, oh, I'm the best player in the world. I think you have I'm a genius. Queen I'm a genius. Jack, so I'm going to value back. He made the he great call, call against, he made the great call against that uh, Bruno Fatusi there with the Jack High, which would would make sense, and I could see someone doing that because it, it kind right. of it was a hand that you could you could piece together and make sense. But then he made the atrocious call against Amnon Filippi with the bottom right. pair and when I run. I mean, that's when I decided that it was no longer sick call trend; it was always call trend. Right, and I think you know it's like the guy that that routinely makes a call with ace high, and when you see it and he wins a pot, it exactly. looks great. But that's a guy that sometimes loses a lot of money making those calls, and I think that's the way Kenny went out of the main event, and that's the way he went out of the horse. And I think if he doesn't make those sick calls there, right. you know who knows? Because well, I th he was you know he was in position to yeah, win both I, those events. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you. I think it's important to realize in, in poker, in general, you are going to get bluffed. And right. it sucks, but you are going to get bluffed, and you're also going to win pots when you're bluffing. Right. And, you know, you have to accept the fact that it's going to happen from time to time. And you well, know it's what? not so only what? that. I mean, it's, a, it's imperative that you can fold those hands because you, ha you need to be able to get bluffed right. to move on in these terms. You can't be one of these guys. It's like you said it perfectly, Roy. The guys, you are going to see that one ace-high call that's going to be so sick, but for every one of those, I'm sure that that guy has probably made three or four 
they put him out of the tournament or crippled or put him in a really really bad spot. So, right. You, you know, know, when you're driving home from the tournament or you're leaving the cash game driving home, it's not the it's not the uh, bad laydown you make that ruined your night. It's the exactly. bad call. It's exactly. always the bad yeah. call. Exactly. Never the bad laydown. Now, one of the things a lot of people don't realize, uh, or they don't realize, some of the good high level cash game players and Roy I've known Roy for what it's got to be probably almost three years now or something he used to be on live with the bike back in the day he plays in all the big cash games that are around the tournaments and of course I cover cash game quarter and I play in the 10 a quarter and he's playing 5100 but we also see Chris Smith who finished uh, at the final table at Turks and Caicos what's the deal with the cash games around these tournaments and I'm talking about the big ones now a lot of when you move up in stakes it, you know Sometimes it can be indicative of worse play, right? right? Just guys with a lot of money. What's your whole take on everything? Well, I think you know. I think it's funny, and I try to look for a good lineup. I, I, whether the fifty hundred or the twenty five fifty or even the ten and, ten and a quarter, I look for the best lineup to play against. And it's interesting. I think when you first get into the cash games, you want to play big name players and you want to prove yourself against them. And I think that that's in cash games. You want to play people that are going to give you their money, and that's my goal right. in the cash games. And it's uh, it's interesting. Actually, I was playing with uh, Barry the other day mm -hmm. in Niagara, and we were in this sick game where these two guys really they did everything they could. And one guy on the river, he says, "I know I'm beat. I don't have anything I can call you with, but I want to see your hand." So he threw ten thousand dollars <laughs> in just to see your hand. I love those guys. I mean, who doesn't want to play oh, with cash course. players in like that? Of course, in a cash game, that's sick. I mean, we talked about. I talked about a little bit about it when uh, Barry and Gavin. We're hosting the show in Niagara, but those were, and, your, and I want to know your opinion, probably some of the craziest walk-up games. What I mean by that is like locals I'd ever seen, right? They really were, and they had one guy who owned, they said, all the uh, adult entertainment establishments in the area, <laughs> and he had a lot of cash, and he, he dumped it into that game like crazy. Now, he would get lucky on you sometimes, and he was dangerous because he'd put you all in with nothing, but... But um, and I think that's the difference between the, the best thing is when the he gets broke too. He he, if you loan him money, he gives you free companionship. That's sure. right. You get actually he did say that we'd come to his clubs anytime <laughs> for free. So we had that going for he us. Get taken care of. You know, one of the other interesting things, and a lot of people don't realize it too, is in the cash games you have like the, a group of players. What makes up a cash game? And I'm talking about in LA, and normally it's some pros, guys that are either doctors that own small businesses, right, um, and guys with you know a ton of money. Um, and Roy was one of those guys, you know, he's a plastic surgeon. I want to ask, ask you about that in a little bit. But it, it's funny because you have kind of transformed yourself into a group of guys. Like we know this guy named Barry Woods who is, uh, you know, one of those types right. of guys. But you transformed yourself from one of those types of guys that I didn't think really played well in the beginning. Now to a few years later, you're having a lot of success. So it, was it just studying the game? How did, how did you turn yourself into one of those, say, whale types into a successful player. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I, well I, you're I, assuming he's going to agree that he was a whale type first. I, you know I, what? I think, I think there were times when I made bad plays on Live at the Bike or other things. Yeah. But the other thing is in Live at the Bike, I also intentionally played a little looser because it brought me more action later on. Um, and my game has evolved. I think, you know, we all change and we all get a little different. And I think that my game has, I hope, improved. And I try to learn a lot from the people who can teach and I read a lot about the game I watch the game a lot and I think I'm a student of the game and even now I think you know winning a WPT event hasn't made me the expert it's still I feel like I'm a student and I feel like I still got a long way to learn and actually I sat yeah. down with Barry the other day and helped me a lot when I was kind of a little bummed about a few things uh, but from watching good players in different styles I think you can pick up a lot of things and I think the, the, like I said before, pushing the action, I think that's the biggest mistake everybody everybody makes. They want to make something happen. They see Tuan Lee call with seven deuce and flop two deuces, and they think that that's an every hand thing. I know. And uh, It's funny. I was just talking to Tuan in there, you know, and, and he walked up, and he's, he's dejected. He's upset. And I was like, Tuan, we got to figure out what's going on here because you and I always have, like, 150000 in, like, the second level, and then we're gone, you know, at the end of the first day. Um, so you're 100% right. You know, there's well, no but question. But, you know, I can explain the Tuan Lee phenomenon. And I think Tuan Lee's a gifted player. Don't get me wrong. Oh, I'm he's not, a, great, I'm not, I'm not, a great player. I'm not taking anything away from him. And I, I had two starting tables with him, the WPT Championship last year and then one of the Bellagio, the like Fiesta, one of those. He basically played every hand for the first three levels, every right. single hand. And I think that um, the if you took 100 players who played like that, you know, two of them are going to have a huge amount of chips right. at the end of a day or two because they're going to run well. But I think for philosophy, you know, I, I now think I play a lot more like Dan Harrington in tournaments, and I think that that's a winning philosophy. It was great to see Dan win the Legends right. because I think if you play and pick your situations carefully, I think that's what's going to get you the best success in tournaments. And yeah, it was great to see Dan uh, win at Legends. It really was. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, awesome. sh sh I know there was a guy that had a lot of chips in that uh, tournament uh, when there was about 15 people left. But look, look, even Barry in the Niagara, you know, he did not have a lot of chips. No. And boom, he finishes fourth place. Well, well, Barry's one of the sick. I mean, this guy can play he short stack poker for days. Literally, yeah, some people can do it for hours. He literally can do it for two days. And let's face it, he's there. got a low skill set and he gets lucky all the time. Uh, well, it goes without 
without saying, obviously. Yeah. Now, shifting <laughs> gears, you have one of the more interesting stories, and uh, we talked a little bit about this before the show because I wanted to see if you were okay with getting into it. But uh, during the main event of the uh, L.A. Poker Classic, right, you were served. Or why don't you go ahead and tell the story? <laughs> go well, ahead. It's, it's kind of a funny story. I was... Uh, uh, I guess I got served divorce papers during the uh, LA Poker Classic by my um, uh, then wife, now ex-wife. And the interesting part about it was during the um, the tag team uh, event there, we actually came in second place in that, and things were good. And then you know a couple of weeks later, all of a sudden things weren't so good. And she, um, we're friendly now, you know, we get along okay. But it was a little shocking to have and that happen. And then you won the Borgata after that, right? Then I won. Right. Then I had my Great World Series run. <laughs> and and uh, you're like, <laughs> well, <laughs> the key to this, the key to the story is how long were you married for? Well, we we were together for almost three years. We lived yeah. together. Whoa, whoa, Things whoa. were good. Don't no, don't try to preface. <laughs> we just want to know how long were you married? For? Well, it was a long time. It was almost six weeks. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we wanted to hear. I didn't want to hear any explanation of how long you're together and why. I just don't. Un- I mean, I've never been married. I just don't understand how how one is married for six weeks. But you want to know what? It was actually a very successful marriage because you know most marriages. <laughs> no, really. It, because most marriages, you're married for five, six, seven, ten years. Then you have a few bad years together, right? And then you think about getting divorced. You get. We right. had we had five and a half perfect. Weeks. <laughs> and we had two bad days. We got divorced. <laughs> <laughs> how, was, how was that bad? There, there wasn't any it's type true. of incident. It it's just true. all went sour in two days. Well, <laughs> there was these two dancers that she probably wasn't. No, no, really, no. There, there was there was really no incident. It was funny too because of, of the six weeks we were married, you know, three of them were spent at the Four Seasons in Hawaii. So right. those were three good weeks. Jeez. Um, I'll marry you if you ask. You think I four seasons? I'll ask you nice. Hey. And um, this was, uh, if anybody's ever watched won't. Card Player Video, <laughs> this was Julie who's on Ben on Card right, Player Video. Right, now on Card Player Video. A few times. And, um, you know, one of the other th- interesting things I've seen in the show, Nip talk a, a few times, you are actually a plastic surgeon. Mm-hmm. Um, and you own a laser removal, tattoo removal place on Sunset Boulevard. Really? I might have to talk. <laughs> hey, no, 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 no. <laughs> this man will not be getting laser removal surgery for his tattoo ever, well, ever. It, it's interesting that in recent years, the media through that show and some other different outlets kind of glamorize the life of a plastic surgeon. Is that really the case? Like a playboy type lifestyle? Well, there is, there is a little something to it. I mean, there is a certain amount of, um, what should I say, uh, Notoriety you get from it, and you know, I had a, I actually had a TV show in the Palm Springs area called Ask Dr. Winston, and that used to get a lot oh, of really? popularity, and it was oh, kind of wow. fun. Um, you know, people would email in and write in questions. And so, uh, so I have a question. What was the onus? So I'm assuming you're you're not practicing as much anymore, if at all. Well, I sold my main practice, and I okay. have a, I have a bunch of clinics that do laser tattoo removal, hair removal, all that laser away. Gotcha. They're in LA, and we're expanding to Vegas and a bunch right. of other places. I'm fine on the hair removal. I don't need any. <laughs> 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 but he. <laughs> But you own those. You're not actually going in and performing the. Uh no, I have I have uh, other people that do gotcha. most of the work. Gotcha. I, like I say, I shake hands and kiss babies. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, so here's my question: What was the onus for leaving that obviously successful situation and getting into poker? Just. Well, you know, I always played poker. I've always played a little bit of cash games here and there, and um, I think I was a little burned out in what I was doing. And um, and, and I was living in Palm Springs. My practice was based there. I had a surgery center, and and I kind of got tired of the town. I wanted to do a little more and, uh, you know, maybe take a few years off, have a little fun, play a little poker, travel, and right. that's what I'm doing. Sounds good. And thank God, thank God I won something. <laughs> now, we're going to see you in Vegas. You're basically now going to follow around the uh, every single t- every, t- every single tour stop? Right. Uh, I'll play I'll play most of the WPT events this year. I may do Australia, too. Uh, so it should be, uh, should be fun. Now, you told me, as we wrap up here, I think a, a while back, an interesting story about how you were going to perhaps purchase a piece of the WPT or something like well, you know, that? It never actually got out, but there was yeah. a num- number, I don't know, maybe a year and a half ago, one of the investment banks that I did some stuff with the WPT was uh, when the stock price really dropped, we had a group of people who was interested in buying, doing some sort of a thing. Uh, uh, it didn't really work out, but it was an interesting idea. And I, you know, I think the WPT is an excellent, uh, really well run and has a lot going for it, but I, I also think that there's so much potential that hasn't been realized in it. You know, and I, the, the mirror we wanted to make it was more like the PGA Tour and do things Absolutely. to kind of grow it and to have more branding of both the players and the place. And it's amazing to me the people I meet who say, you know, I don't even know how to play poker, but I love watching it on TV. Everyone, and everyone. it's crazy, you know, and, and you, go to, you go to a casino Arizona in Phoenix and you have a bunch of blue-haired ladies who sit there and play $1, $2 games, right. you know, all night long and love to watch it on TV. The following is, is crazy. Well, I mean, if you take control, I will definitely play in the Winston I'm Poker Tour. I'm, <laughs> I'm there's no question. I'm the WPT I, don't think the w- I don't think you'd be allowed to go with the Winston Poker Tour, though. Why? Because there's the Winston Cup. It'd probably be copyright. Uh, oh, no, different Winstons. I'll, different bet, Winston. I'll, bet, I'll bet you on that one. Now, when you say you more like so? the PGA Tour, 
I always thought it was interesting that, you know, poker is the only type of thing where all the money comes from the players, right? I mean, there isn't any type of ancillary money from the sponsorships that's going well, to but the actually, prize pools. But actually, the PGA Tour, they do pay a little entry fee. It's like $180 right. a, a Nominal a entry fee, Nominal. right? Yeah. But, but the, I think that the thing about it is that the we haven't gotten mainstream as far as the outside endorsements in poker. And then that's really, I think, is a huge boat that's missed. You know, you, all you have are the, are the internet poker sites and a... A few little things uh, doing endorsements, but they're really. I have, I have an endorsement with Black Velvet Canadian whiskey. Then you and you date the Black Velvet girl too, so you. No, got I don't date her anymore. <laughs> <laughs> anymore. <laughs> what about Kentucky Fried Chicken with the drumstick? That's always true. Up I remember in that. Mouth. Kentucky yeah. Fried Chicken. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I agree though, one hundred percent. I mean, I think that it's you know part of the problem is just the fact that you know a lot of the money has been kind of directed away, you know, with the, uh, you know, laws and whatnot in the government. But there's so much untapped potential in terms of sponsorships and all that kind of stuff. Well, the other, and the other idea that we have, which I think is still a great idea, is to do some sort of pro-am. You know, the PGA Tour, before each event, yeah. they have these pro-ams. Right. And, you you know, people love to play against the named celebrities, but they don't want to ante up $10,000 to sit at a table. But if you had a featured table, you know, with one celebrity player at each one, and people could Definitely. pay a smaller fee, and that money could go then to finance the players into the main events and sure. the other events. I mean, sure. there's, there's certainly ways that things could be constructed. Um and I think it would be very successful. And I think that the, the public as a whole, everybody wants to play with the, the celebrities. They love to say, oh, I knocked, you know, Phil Ivey out. And sure. I think that that's, um, you know, when I first, the first event I played and I knocked Gus Hansen out. And I was, like, so thrilled I got to knock <laughs> Gus Hansen out. Yeah. Um, well, makes, makes sense. we will see you in Vegas. Good luck. Thanks for stopping by, Ray. Sorry about what happened to you uh, today, but I'm not really that sorry since you took down, what, <laughs> a million three in Borgata? Actually, a million five seventy four. Wow. Million five seventy four. Wow. After, after taking down hundreds of thousands at the... Uh, at the main event as well. Right. And a lucrative plastic surgeon. I'm, get, I'm getting by. It's okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank <laughs> you. Well, thank you. Yeah, sure. Thanks for having me. I really and, appreciate uh, it, guys. Right on. We will be back here with more on Boca Road Radio. And we're back here. Well, what an interesting segment we just had with uh, Roy Winston. It reminds me, you know, you can go to him and get that tattoo of uh, C-Box initials. Removed. I think right? what Roy I Winston needed to do was actually get marital advice from Haralibos oh, uh, beforehand. And then... <laughs> I think he would have had a shot at it last in nine weeks. I wonder how big her hands are. That, that's just, a real question. You know, it was interesting. He kind of blew over the thing, but I, it's just, you know, you're with somebody for three years, right. and then you're married for six weeks, and then it's just over in two days. It would seem to me that some something happened. Well, I don't know I, what. I, I will tell you this much. But My wonderful and beautiful fiance, um, at times can be a little volatile, and things – are seemingly small to me seem rather large to her, <laughs> right? Uh, Which that is being weird. Said, I don't think she'd call it quits after five and a half weeks. True. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's strange to me because generally women are so rational. <laughs> So yeah. it's just, right. <laughs> it's so odd to me. You know, I don't know what it is. I don't know what it is. I don't know. That's that's crazy stuff. Uh, Bobby Blonde no longer in Survivor. The world's we're, coming to an end. We're gonna be back here uh, well, with more absolute. Happen now to a game of poker. <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna be back with more absolute news tomorrow, and uh, day three. And I believe that we will squeak into the money, won't we? Uh, they're yeah. gonna get, they're yeah. gonna get close. It'll, it'll yeah. be it'll be right on the. It'll I think be right get around in. it. You want to make a bet? I um, think they'll get in. Yeah, I'll bet they don't. All right, bet hundred bucks. You got it. All right. So you bet that they do? Bet that they do. I say they'll be in the money by the end of play tomorrow. He bets that they do. Yep. I, say, I bet they don't. Correct. All right. Well, we'll be back here tomorrow. Join us again here from Connecticut. We'll see you next time here on Book Road Radio.